Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my very special guest, Adam Short, former member of the NAR. Adam, it's so good to have you on here today. We've uh, talked about having you on to talk about all things NAR, and you have some connections to all kinds of various groups that just fascinate me because as I begin to explore all these connections from what we call the NAR today back through the timeline into what I came out of, I'm learning more and more, and <laughs> literally I'm seeing each movement seems to be like a replica of the former movement, and they tweak it just a little bit to make it appealing to the itching ears, and then a new concept is formed and a new you know, new network in the NAR emerges. So glad to have you on so you can talk through your experiences in all of these, and I thought maybe it'd be good if you just told a little bit about yourself and your connection to all of this. Sure. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Appreciate uh, all you're doing. And uh, came across your podcast, I think, just through the IHOP uh, scandal that a lot of us have been following. So uh, that's been hugely informative uh, because I, like many people, was pumped full of William Branham. Uh, I guess now you can call it indoctrination, right, from many years ago. And so this is still very fresh news for me to learn the nasty history behind William Branham. So I've learned a lot from your content and then others that have been on your show. So just a little bit about me. Um, so my wife and I formally, I, I guess you could say extricated or de-churchified um, about 13 years ago. And I can just say for me personally, that was after having spent about, gosh, the bulk of my adult life in uh, churches that are now called NAR, which I honestly had not even heard that term um, until recently, which is a seemingly a common thing. I've heard other people say, I don't even know what that the NAR or NAR is. I was one of those people only to find out that 13 years later after leaving uh, some of these movements that that's all lumped in in the, in the NAR uh, movement. And I actually had no idea. So I'm learning a lot about what we were a part of, what we belonged to for many years, uh, ever since I got saved in, in a pretty dramatic encounter with the Lord back in 1998. That's when I met the Lord. And so it's been a long, long journey to say the least. And so this IHOP scandal that hit back in October of 2023 became really personal to me because I did live in Kansas City um, in the early 2000s and was a part of Metro Christian Fellowship, which is the church that Mike started. It used to be Kansas City Fellowship, Kansas City Vineyard, and then evolved to Metro Christian Fellowship. So, um, so, th so there, there are a lot of common threads um, between Metro and IHOP because of the common foundership. Um, and then was informally connected to, to IHOP um, and very influenced by them for many years. So there's a lot I can share about just other involvement with a couple other key churches there. But, uh, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, very eager to continue learning, but also we, my wife and I are also very eager to share more about our story soon publicly. Awesome. Well, I'd like to talk to her as well whenever we get a chance. But <clears throat> what sure. you said reminded me of myself. So I grew up in the Branham cult, and we were so isolated that we believed it was like all cults. It was the elite. You were the only ones. But even further than that, we were somewhat suppressed in our knowledge of how it formed to the extent we didn't realize that there were hundreds of ministers in this big revival, and we thought that William Branham was the you know, the central figure to reign above all of them, not knowing that he was just one of, you know, many. <clears throat> but yeah. we also were not told, like you say that you didn't recognize the, the NAR until after you left. I had no idea what Christian identity was, even though this was a Christian identity movement based on British Israelism and other themes. I just heard that term in the news, and when you hear it in the news, it's usually with the extremists that have 
had some sort of climactic event. And so you, <laughs> you picture guns and rifles and a standoff and not realizing right. that, no, this was actually a doctrine that many of these guys believed. And the yeah. doctrine was the foundation that bore the fruits that you see in the news. And that concept was very, very difficult in the same way that the NAR is a framework that bears some fruits that you see in the pseudo political realm today. It's it, the similarities are are very close to each other, but the NAR developed because of latter rain, and they all reference William Branham as their yeah. one of quote unquote God's generals. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, and you know, to your point about God's generals, I mean, that's a pretty charged sort of label or moniker, as it were especially having come from deep involvement in Bethel um, because, you know, I was, I was actually part-time, part-time staff at Bethel for a while. Um, went through all three years of BSSM, which is this, you know, the school of supernatural ministry. And one of the, we actually still have these and I, you know, I've debated whether to throw them away, the blue, you know, the blue, you probably know these backwards in front, but the blue books about William Branham, they're like 10 yeah. or 12 volumes. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? I, I could go grab some <laughs> off the shelf if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, so we still have those in our house. And, you know, flashing back to Bethel when, and then also God's General's book, where, I mean, literally this guy walked on water, you know. And you look at the th the common thread. We never, I mean, we heard he ended badly. Like we were told at Bethel that he ended badly, but that we weren't to throw out all of the, good stuff that that was sort of prior to that and um and so you you look you look at that and then you look at let's watch how bethel is handling the bickle scandal let's watch how ihop is handling the bickle sc scandal post bickle supposedly separating from you know from IHOP. let's look at morningstar how they've handled it let's look at charisma magazine and so many other organizations and they're doing the same thing they're like let's let's keep the good stuff if there is any good stuff and i mean that's i don't even think if is it appropriate anymore i think we've all anybody with a brain can now <laughs> the reason for themselves is that like there's nothing good left like i mean we have to throw all of this out we can't even keep you know to to compare to the william brand thing we can't keep just because there were miracle signs and wonders that people point to and i know you debunked that in your podcast um, that doesn't substantiate or validate that God did any of it, right? And so those are the kinds of things that many of us are wrestling with on Twitter every day. It's like, how, what do we keep? What do we not keep? What do we throw out? And then how do I interpret that? Uh, or I don't even know if that's the right word, but how, how, what do I do about my own experience with God, right? Because I think a lot of people have said, Okay, let's just throw the whole thing out. I'm walking away from my faith completely. I don't even believe that the Bible's true anymore. I do personally. I'm just saying there are a lot of people who have come to that conclusion, which, and I don't fault them for that, right? Like when you've gone through something to that degree of severity, yeah, that probably sounds reasonable to just throw the whole thing out, right? And so anyway, it's... uh it's a it's a thread that you pull and you keep pulling and pretty soon it's like the whole the, ho the whole house is crashing down so yeah it's it's very difficult to go through the deconstruction and i remember going through it there's there's a part of your makeup your internal makeup that wants to cling to something and say well something i had was true and so you keep holding on to these things and you realize that those things were built upon other things that were false and so you wipe that layer off and you just keep wiping away layers until you know it really does feel a lot of people mistake what they've deconstructed as atheism because they have had a false god all of those years and yeah. at the end of it you have deconstructed a false god so you have no god yeah. and some people get stuck right there they don't reconstruct or they don't you know it's a lot of effort to rebuild your entire life that you have just washed away with fiction and yeah. I remember I came to the point, there were things that William Branham said that were good. I'm not going to discredit those, but they all had this twist to them. And if you took it for what he said, it was usually a twist in, toward some agenda. 
And so if you kept that in your mind, you're literally upholding the framework that's bad. And I think one of, there was just a handful of things I kept. And one of them was he, he said over and over that he liked to baptize his pancakes in syrup. I don't fault the man for that. <laughs> Actually, that's that's a that's the way you eat a pancake, man. And right, yeah. I was going to ask you what were what was an example of something you decided to keep, and that's it. So that's your that's the that's the big punchline, right? You baptize that's, you. Yeah, <laughs> you that's, pancakes, or, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. you know, there were some good religious things too, but the problem is when you deconstruct from a religious cult, if you hang on to any single thing that was religious there could be some deception embedded in it. And yeah. I kept, I for years, I tried to hold on to something that I had. And, and there were things like now after having started reconstruction, I'm nowhere even close to ending it, you know, but having re- started to reconstruct my life, there are things that he said that probably match where I am today. But if I make the error of choosing what he said, it could also bring some of that false foundation. So there came a point, it was about 2000, maybe 14-ish, maybe 2015, I wiped the slate completely empty, completely blank. In, in In my heart, I said, okay, I'm going to pretend as of today that I've never heard the name Jesus. I've never heard about Christianity. Tell me more. And I started meeting with local pastors, and we started talking through, you know, and other Christians, too. We started talking, what are the basics, the basic concept of Christianity? Mm -hmm. And I'll admit fully that that's difficult because depending on which person you talk to and what is their background, you're going to get vastly different answers. And so Mm -hmm. in the end, I kind of ignored all that as well. And okay, what does the Bible say? And I just started yeah. there. I read it over and over and over, probably 10, 15 times. Lost count, but cover to cover, I just started over. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. It's it's kind of where you come to. And I'm so used to, I, I should say it this way, I'm so unused to or not used to going to church now. Like I, I the only time, I mean, am I, am I saying this publicly? The only time that I go to church now is to go to our son's, our son goes to a, a private Christian school and, you know, he, they do end of year, you know, programs, right? Like beginning, end of year program, but it's a Presbyterian church. And you have to know how refreshing it is to actually step in as a, as a, as somebody like me, who's a, who is a recovering former hyper charismatic to step into a Presbyterian church. It's so refreshing because you get somebody up there, that prays a 15 second prayer, it, it's like, oh wow, you're not asking me to work up this manufactured faith of some sort and come in and like with blood, sweat and tears and run down to the altar. And oh, by the way, while we're at it, let's heal a few people, which I still believe in all that stuff. I still believe in healing and miracles, but like you, you, you go through so many years of watching this stuff getting hyped up and, and and then used as notches on the belt to sort of say that I've made it as a Christian. Like I've seen the, the, the deaf heal, you know, the deaf ears open, the blind eyes open, blah, 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 blah. So, that, so you step into like a, a regular plain Jane Presbyterian church and somebody prays for five seconds. It's so refreshing. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm like of the opinion, like, put everything on the chopping block. Nothing is off the table. And I'm with you, like whatever the perspective is, I want to hear it. I want to hear somebody's perspective, especially if it's a survivor of abuse, what they have to say, and I'll include myself in that because I'm a survivor, whatever they or we have to say needs to be heard. Um, however that fits into somebody's theology, because it's, it's a real person's experience of how they were damaged. Yeah. By a system like this. Yeah. And that's really why I do the format that I do. I don't care who you are. I've had people who are atheists on here. I've had all kinds of different faiths and <laughs> some some actually pretty weird beliefs, but I I just don't focus on that because I can learn from everyone and they all have an experience yeah. and there's a reason why they have turned out the way that they have and people need to hear that reason. So yeah. that's the reason for the format, but I do tell the people 
who are in the support groups just you know same stage you're going through right now it's difficult to go to church there comes a point after you have been under spiritual abuse and religious abuse that you have to take a step away from the abusers yeah. in the same way if you were if you were under spousal spousal abuse well if you go to a counselor they're not going to tell you to immediately enter the dating scene because every if you're a female, every man that you meet is a potential danger to you, and you're going to have that in the back of your head until you heal. And right. <clears throat> there are people who get so triggered by church, but they were whipped in the charismatic world to believe, forsake yourself not together for <laughs> to assemble together for the reading of Scripture, for example. They beat mm-hmm. you in the head with that, but they don't tell you the other half of that. 99% of the people who that verse applied to couldn't read. So if they didn't gather together, they couldn't hear the Bible. And uh, mm. and okay. even as that verse was written, the Bible didn't exist. <laughs> the Bible form, yeah. you know, centuries later. So <clears throat> I tell them to take it slowly. The thing that the, the really destructive thing that these charismatic movements have implanted in our heads is this false sense of urgency. It has to happen yeah. now. You're going to miss it. If it doesn't happen today, yes. it's going to happen tomorrow. Yes. And that's the first thing you have to recover from when you escape because you have this urgency to get back into church and you make mistakes and you, some people get re-victimized because they'll join another oh, cult. Totally. Have 100%. to get rid of the urgency. Oh, 100%. It's, and, you know, and I have not done the deep dive, I think, that you have in this, but it, you know, looking at this now, it's a now uh, theology, the, the dominionism now, like it has to happen now. Right. There, you know, by this time tomorrow, everything will change. I mean, I've, I've heard that line more times than I can count at Bethel. So it's like you're standing in your spot. You're hearing this message right now in this building. And unless you make the decision to respond to this now word, then it's FOMO, fear of missing out. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss. What are you going to miss? You're going to miss. You're going to get derailed in your destiny, right? You're going to miss the next latest and greatest anointing. You're going to miss a prophetic word. Oh, and by the way, you're not going to impact the world like you were destined to do. So it's like this compounding snowball that freaking just lambasts you. And you, you get that time and time and time again. And I've been out of it for 13 years. But as I talk about it, it's just as fresh as it was yesterday. Like, I mean... My wife and I have been deconstructing since twenty, what, twenty eleven. We we started wow. deconstructing in twenty eleven, and so before it became a fad. Right, right now it's like really popular to deconstruct. But we've been doing this for a while. It's not, you know, we have we've been out of church for a long time, and so, but it's still like such a multi layered long process. It's intellectual. It's emotional. It's spiritual. It's relational, it's financial. It covers the gamut, the entire gamut. So, and, and, and so it's not a quick process, as you know. No. It takes a while. Well, I mean, picture your average person who grew up in a quote unquote normal church, whatever that means to the listener who's, <laughs> who's listening. Yeah, right. You, you grew up under certain things that were concepts that you had to learn before you could learn the next concept and each similar to what the way the way you deconstruct you take off layer by layer by layer well these people have had some of them 30 years to build up the layers of true foundation while we just tore down false foundation so you can't even really expect to be even close to them for 20 30 years but because there's that sense of urgency people dive into it and they try to reconstruct quickly and in my opinion, there's danger in doing that, and there's a whole lot of spiritual leaders that see it as this open field or opportunity to gain new converts to Christianity. I think mm. they need to take a step back and understand what is deconstruction and reconstruction. Yeah, I love that. You know, it seems like there are more and more people talking about reconstruction. I think Blaze and Christina Foray, um, who, and they've become one of the sort of you know influencers in the ihop scandal they've really done a great job of speaking out and helping people walk through it but they've talked about reconstructing and i love what they've shared um 
And, and that, that is going to look different for each person, right? I mean, some people choose to deconstruct and they don't reconstruct. And it, it's like, look, I'm throwing everything out and I just want to start a new life and believe something different. And you know what? That's the beauty of being a human is you can do that. You can just make that decision. Um, I think for me personally, it it's not quite as simple because the deconstruction process has been very, very layered and long term. But for me, with that, it's not just deconstruction. It's I'm you know working with therapists, working with other people that I trust to help me unpack and heal from this, and like I, I'm pursuing that, and it, and it's you know it takes a while. Um, so it's not just a matter of, Hey, I'm going to throw out what I used to believe. It's like, no, I have trauma. I actually have trauma that I'm navigating through painful yeah. trauma and relational, like, you know, relational breakups that you have. And there's just a lot of loss that goes on, um, behind the scenes. I think that's, that's more and more talked about now than it was before, but it's still very much, uh, I think a nascent concept that, um, that there's a lot more going on than what meets the eye in the individual person's life. Yeah. It's a lot of work to have to go through that because you have to relearn everything and you're starting yeah. from scratch. At least I started from scratch and you know, there's this, the other problem that I see with the charismania is that the God that they have presented, like I said, it's a false God. So you're tearing down this false God, but he's a very domineering narcissistic personality you know, whip you into shape and whip you into shape right now or you're going to be doomed to hell. He's that kind of God. <clears throat> and so when people reconstruct, a lot of times they struggle to understand what is the God of the Bible. And worse mm. than that, <clears throat> the God that the charismania has taught you is really powerless because if you were an atheist and you go astray, the salvation is on your shoulders, not on God's. Whereas yeah. if you believe the Christian God and he's all powerful, all knowing, I'm close friends with several people who have left the cult and they have chosen to be atheist because who am I to say that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, God doesn't lead them back into God. You know what I'm saying? If God is right. the powerful God that the Bible speaks of, we, we have to believe that that's going to be the case. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, it's the age old, probably the oldest theological debate in the book, right? Between, you know, is God sovereign or do we have free will? And we're so binary in the way we look at things in Western culture. You know, it's either on or off, one or zeros, you know, everything's digital zeros and ones. And, but, but isn't it both? Don't we have a free will? And isn't God also like, if you believe in God, isn't he also. <sighs> I don't know. I don't even know what your word to use, but isn't he powerful? <laughs> yeah. I, and, I mean, I, I wonder that myself, like what, 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 uh, what are all the things that don't happen every day that could have happened that were bad? Like, think about it. Like, and I don't understand why some people get into a car accident in rush hour and other people don't like, I'm thankful. I didn't get one on the way to my office today, but all that stuff comes into play when you try to figure out what life means because yeah, we have a free will, we think, but then when you've been pumped with this belief, like you said, that it all rests on my shoulders, like this is all about the, 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 the depth of the well of faith that I have to engage God, to pull him down. Right. So, and then we're going to, we're going to release and manifest heaven on earth. Yeah. Um, but when you take that theology, when you take that belief system, to the nth degree, you end up with what's going on in Redding right now, Redding, California, where Bethel is. They are literally infiltrating city council. And I'm all for, you know, being a light in the darkness, but they've taken to the point where they're in city council. They use the convention center for their e events in the school. Their, their fingers are literally in everything, real estate. They, they're just massive you know, real estate investments. Um, they have a, a huge influence on the local real estate market. So all these things are outworkings of believing that it's our responsibility to like bring this dominion to earth. 
Yeah. And you know what it reminds me of, John? It reminds me of things I've read about the uh, the Crusades back yeah. in, you know, back, what was that, like around 1000 AD or so-ish? It's very similar. <clears throat> yeah, I had the conversation the other day with a therapist, and we were talking about <laughs> the version of religion that these guys are touting is completely overturned by the thief on the cross. This guy didn't believe Jesus his whole life. He wasn't a convert. He didn't have that sense of urgency. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. How can you apply that to the theology that comes out of charismania? You simply can't. And uh, to your point about the car wreck, so there are things, I don't share them often because I, I strongly keep my personal journey away from the podcast. I don't want the public to know. I don't want them to follow me or my religion or anything. I'm not a pastor or anything like this, but one of the things that I did overturn, which I will say this publicly, is that the car wreck thing. So some people die in a car wreck and they're good Christians. Other people who are atheists drive the same street and they live through it. How can you, how can you answer this? Well, see the charismania and (laughs) Laterania <laughs> have taught such a false <laughs> version of God <clears throat> that it became a rabbit's foot God. If you stayed mm. in this thing and you rubbed yeah. a little rabbit's foot God, he's going to protect you when you drive down the street. Or, I was yeah. with one person and they they were trying to find a parking place and <laughs> literally zoomed into the parking place and cut some family off that were getting ready to turn in there and then yeah. bowed down and said, oh, Lord, thank you for giving me this parking place so close. My back hurts. And I'm like, come on, you just cut, <laughs> you cut that person right. off. Yeah. They, they have invented a new God, and it is a rabbit's foot God, and if you rub it, then you get yeah. some sort of a miracle. It's so true. Oh, my gosh, it's so true. Your analogy about the rabbit's foot, you know what I, my wife and I've talked about is the um, the lottery god, like the slot <laughs> machine. <laughs> yeah, like, I was just actually it's funny. I was on the phone two nights ago with an old friend of mine who used to be at Bethel. We hadn't talked in years, and we were kind of unpacking and talking through for like two hours about Bethel stuff. And and that's one of the things we're talking about. Is like like if you really boil it down, like there's a slot machine, I pull a slot machine for, to, you know, to get healed. I pull a slot machine for financial blessing. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna pull the slot machine for what else did I miss? Um, the perfect spouse, <laughs> like pull that slot machine. Like, and so this ends up becoming this very me centered, uh, ecosystem where whatever I want, out of the slot machine, I pull it. So here's the problem though. What if you pull the slot machine and you don't get triple sevens? Yeah. What if, what if you end up with triple six? <laughs> <laughs> but, you I mean, know, it's it's this big religion of a casino, right? But there is one difference. You get an apostle there that's gonna kick the slot machine and try to make it come out in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, or, or, or maybe they tell you, no, you're reading the numbers wrong. You're actually, the numbers actually say triple seven, it's just your vision's bad or something. <laughs> <laughs> so but but like it's it's true though like that's the that's that's really the practical outworking and i'm going to count it and so now i i go back and i i think in my brain the offering deck i don't know have you ever heard the, the bethel offering declaration before i have not have you heard it um so there's a lot of financial language in there okay so in some of this stuff every Sunday you're saying, you know, raises and bonuses, estates and inheritances, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, um, gifts and surprises, debts paid off, blessings and increase. These are the things that like, I, I even remember it today so well because it's ingrained in my, in my head. I'm an accountant by profession. And here's the, here's the thing though. Here's my, um, my objection to the offering declaration. If you want to raise in a bonus, you're probably going to have to add more value to your employer to get a raise in a bonus. It's not this slot machine that I pull or, oh, by the way, estates and inheritance. You know what has to happen for somebody to, for you to have an estate and inheritance? Somebody has to die. <laughs> yes. So basically what we're doing is during your offering, you're declaring and hoping that people are going to die so you inherit their money. Like, 
Think about it. Just use your brain for a second and think about that. That's the kind of stuff that we're told is the gospel. Um, and I'm not saying God can't bless people and, you know, do financial miracles, of course. But like when that becomes the norm, you're setting people up for a disaster. Have you ever wondered how the Pentecostal movement started or how the progression of modern Pentecostalism transitioned through the latter reign, charismatic and other fringe movements into the new apostolic reformation? You can learn this and more on William Branham Historical Research's website, william-branham.org. On the books page of the website, you can find the compiled research of John Collins, Charles Paisley, Stephen Montgomery, John McKinnon, and others, with links to the paper, audio, and digital versions of each book. You can also find resources and documentation on various people and topics related to those movements. If you want to contribute to the cause, you can support the podcast by clicking the Contribute button at the top. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe to the audio or video version that you're listening to or watching. On behalf of William Branham Historical Research, we want to thank you for your support. It's so wrong. And whether it's the rabbit's foot god or the slot, I'm going to use that from now on, the, <laughs> the slot machine god. And the Good irony, boy. if you've studied my podcast, the irony is that all of this started in a casino in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Are you serious? I, yeah, Branham was, uh, you can go back, I can't remember what episode it was, but this whole oh thing god. started because Branham and his family lived on a casino and they on the grounds at a casino <clears throat> and they were producing liquor for Al Capone and the mob. Oh yes. And, okay. I did listen to that piece. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the irony, this is more of a slot machine <laughs> religion than it was, but see the faith healing aspect that was, that was pure rabbit's foot because if you mm-hmm. believe that you went into this thing, you could rub the foot and you know, I knew people who suffered tremendously through their life until they died, believing that and confessing that they had been healed so they're rubbing a rabbit's foot that did nothing but still giving reverence to the rabbit's foot their whole Mm -hmm. lives and you know part of my journey out which i also talk very little about but i had a family member who was suffering very very much with cancer and the rabbit's foot god just simply did not work and it's it's horrific what they put in your head and to the financial aspect you know that's a very sad story but you're right for the financial aspect they want you to give them money and pretend that you're going to get some back by pulling the slot machine but who's the one who rakes in all the money it's the casinos totally it's so it's actuarial science you know if you want to go in and and research that it's that's what it is there would be no viable business model for a casino or um, even an insurance company, for example, life insurance company. The only reason that makes sense is because the probability of a payout is lower than the probability of a pay-in. And so um, you're absolutely right. Like the casinos, most of the time, probably what, nine out of 10 times, I don't know what the statistic is, they're, they're gonna end up um, ahead because they're, they're taking in more money than they are giving out. And you're right, it's like, the churches are now structured where all the money flows to the top and the honor culture is a manifestation of that. I think, I think that, um, and, and how much of that came from Branham? I mean, what, I mean, was there this honor culture in the Branham organizations where it's like all the deference, all of the respect, all of the, really everything just flows up that pyramid to the top. Was that something that was pushed down from Branham into Laterrain and then now into our charismatic movements, or is that something that they added later? Well, it was a collaboration. So I'm I'm working on my manuscript for my next book, which is on the NAR, <clears throat> which uh-huh. does cover Branham history. But remember, there were hundreds of these men, and there wasn't just one movement that combined to create the NAR. Some of these were the Christian businessmen. So you being accountant, you'll understand when you turn religion into a business, there's a lot of money that can be made in it. So you had the Christian businessmen that formed. You also had (laughs) the chapter that I'm working on right now. I'm, I'm talking through the or writing through the Fellowship International. This is one of the most covert and deceptive espionage 
aspects of the NAR today. There, there was a gentleman who ran it, I think, until 2017-ish, named Doug Coe. He, they referred oh, to this yeah. as, yeah, so they referred to this as family. the family. Yeah, the quote-unquote family. Yeah, there's family. a documentary about this. Mm-hmm. Well, he was referred to as the godfather because their family literally controlled everything, and not just simply in religion, also in politics. People like Hillary Clinton were involved in the family, and they kept secrets so the congressman that they're grooming could go into these houses and sleep around with other women, and they all kept it secret. Actually, that's how the family became exposed so that they could have this this what is it 20 2022 documentary i think it was 2009 there were several congressmen that got caught going to the houses owned by the family and (laughs) sleeping around with with strange women and um it all got exposed but the godfather kept it up as a secret and once you're part of the family you're part of the family we keep your secrets but the moment you leave you become at risk because just like the mafia we you have right. to, once you're a member you're always a member basically and so that's just one aspect there were numerous groups that merged to form the NAR some of them like this that had espionage networks globally into politics religion military everything else so and you know I've heard bits and pieces you know mainly on Twitter and I, I think you talked about it too in your, one of your last episodes maybe with uh, all in uh, related to Paul Kane and his involvement with the CIA. And I forgot the name of the program. Was it Stargate or something like that? Um, and I mean, there are people who have firsthand knowledge about this on Twitter. I won't name any names, but um, who, who have actually spoken to Paul Kane about this. And I know you spoke to Paul Kane too, but like, was that, is that a part of this family or is that just kind of an extension of it? Or, you know, what was that? I mean, how did he get into that? Um, how, how was he invited into that? Was he a part of the family too, or, or was that something separate? Yeah, so this, well, first I'll, I'll answer the first part of the question. Stargate is one of my favorite movies of all time. <laughs> and it was this excellent TV series if you haven't seen it. That's completely separate from Paul Kane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, anyway, so... This, this edge is very close to conspiracy theory, which I avoid and I don't put on my website. Had it not actually been documented, I would never have put it on my website. <clears throat> but there was a organization, it was a black ops government organization, and it was, it was called MK Ultra, I believe was the official code name. Okay, that rings a bell. <clears throat> yeah, so these guys working with the government, they were trying to covertly stop outside of the public vote they were being commissioned to stop what they believed to be a uprising of people with black skin so when you consider the latter rain and all of the christian identity folk that were in this that was their number one mission to stop the people with black skin so unfortunately we don't have a document linking them directly to branham what we do have Whenever this was discovered that the government was doing this, they burned and destroyed every single document, just shredded everything. (laughs) But they missed an entire room of 10,000 documents. So that's how we know that this existed. And they did Mm -hmm. things like they commissioned the sanctioning of people to go spread LSD on the streets to black people. Wow. So that the black people could get, yeah. they believe that they would become so doped up that there wouldn't be this civil war that they felt was imminent. So mm-hmm. anyway, this there's a movie out there. It's, it's a terrible movie, but it's called Men Who Stare at Goats. George Clooney's in it, Brad Pitt, and has all the makings of a good movie, but it will bore the heck out of you. They had mm-hmm. <laughs> they had covert operatives within this organization who were doing things like staring at goats to see if they could control the goat's mind. Oh, so wow. when you consider everything that they were doing, even if we don't have documentation, you had yeah. these faith healers that were claiming that they could see visions and prophesy and control people, okay. which the government noticed, hey, there's this whole group of charismania that are actually mm-hmm. controlling the minds. Can we weaponize this? So, so they, they kind of saw sense. an opportunity to sort of invite some of those 
exactly high end, you know, influencers in like Paul Kane. Yeah, I discovered it by accident because there was a claim that Jim Jones was in this thing, <clears throat> which I've talked to the heads of the Jonestown Institute. They say it's very unlikely, so I have to mm. I have to go by their assessment. But I can assure you that naming the people that were connected to Branham, that were also connected to the family, that were connected to Nazi Germany and other things, I can say that this is probably likely that Paul Kane was telling the truth, but I can't prove it. Yeah. Well, there are some people on Twitter who are talking publicly about it. You know, that they, they were told very explicitly by Paul, you know, of the involvement that he claimed to have in that program, you know, with the CIA, but... But yeah, I mean, it's it's like it's wild, like that that you get to your way out there and in, in even spy land with this stuff. Like yeah. that's how uh, that's how pervasive and influential these movements are. Well, and when you, know? you consider the the family, the Fellowship International. It was an international, like the National Prayer Breakfast we have today. They set this up globally, and so. I just, in fact, uh, I'll try to pull it up for the podcast. I don't know if I can find it again, but I was reading an article where they were branded as one of the elite covert espionage operations that were spying on governments of not just the United States, but other countries. So when you consider the fact that Paul Kane, William Branham, I've got a photo of Branham at this prayer breakfast with Nixon. Mm -hmm. So when you consider all these guys were connected to this thing and they're connected to international leaders, you could you could make the leap to say that the family is what brought Paul Kane into contact with all of this. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's just about like a logical jump to conclude that. So you have some experience with International House of Prayer or IHOP, and right now it's, it's the number one hottest topic on my website. So it'd be good if you just told a little bit about some of that experience. Yeah, so kind of like I alluded to in the beginning, so I moved to Kansas City in 2004. Um, there's a whole story to how that happened, but essentially moved out there to pursue a uh, program that was uh, affiliated with Metro Christian Fellowship indirectly uh, related to church planning and missions. And so through that process, um, and because of the affiliation with IHOP, because IHOP was, was kind of post Metro when Mike was pastor of uh, Metro, he left Metro, I think in 2000, if I remember correctly, because he, he started IHOP in 99. So I got to Kansas City in 2004, was very much um, involved in the prayer room. I was not officially in their programs or anything, but I you know went to the prayer room, knew people there. Um, and there were definitely overlaps of community that was a part of IHOP and then also the, the organization I was a part of. So from that standpoint, um, exposure to IHOP became pretty forefront. Um, you know, the prayer movement, the 24 seven prayer, their worship, um, that became very formative to me in my walk with the Lord and, and very influential. And so, um, I was only in Kansas city for two years, but like I said, knew a lot of the people at IHOP and Metro. And so, um, and then after that, after spending some time on the mission field, came back and actually uh, moved to Bethel, to Reading in 2007. So I was at Bethel from 2007 to 2011. And so it was like the IHOP slash Metro layer and then built on top of that, the Bethel. So all that stuff was like pumped into me. I was net deep in it, very influential. And at the time, you know, I thought this was like the pinnacle of Christianity, right? Like you're in the... <laughs> And so many people said that you're in the elite special forces of, of Christianity where we see, you know, dreams, visions, miracles, healings, dead being raised. Um, and, but it wasn't until we left Bethel, um, we actually left Bethel in 2011 and um, I made a career change into the world of finance and accounting. And through a whole series of circumstances after Bethel, you know, kind of started having eye opening uh, experience, realizing that a lot of the stuff that we had been exposed to was probably not healthy. And, you know, I have my whole story of 
going through some spiritual abuse a couple different times that also created more distance for me. And I just, I didn't want to have anything to do with church at that point. And so, um, yeah, we just, we stopped going to church. We started like peeling back the onion, the layers of, uh, things that were, that were, that we felt were harmful and were hurtful and damaging. Um, and so that kind of started in 2011. Um, and then up until last year when the IHOP thing hit, I mean, I have not been in the circles of church or really kept up with anything church wise in a long time. So when the, when the IHOP stuff hit in Bickle back in October of 23, um, a lot of people who I'd not talked to in 20 years started surfacing on Twitter. And I'm like talking to people that I knew that were involved in the, um, that were aware and very connected to the Bickle scandal because they knew the victims. They knew the Jane Doe one. They knew uh, some of the other uh, folks. And I actually knew a couple of the people um, firsthand as well. And so it became very personal to me. And at that point I decided I have to speak out. I've never spoken out before about anything that I've experienced in these movements. And so that was really a big turning point for me to watch the victims and the survivors come forward, mainly women in their bravery and courage and share their stories publicly. Um, it's like it snowballed. There were so many other people like myself who decided to come out and begin to share their experience, uh, begin to uh, collectively try to hold IHOP and Mike Bickle accountable, try to get Bethel to speak up, to which this day they haven't done. And so it's um, it's still very much an ongoing process. There's a lot left to unpack, but um, I think there's a groundswell of people who they're, they're just saying enough's enough. We're not going to pretend that this is not happening anymore. And I would like to think that enough uh, voices speaking out and enough people that stop feeding the cash flow machine will make a difference. So I, my wife and I are like, we plan to start a podcast to talk about this stuff. Um, not just this, but a bunch of other life stuff, business, things like that. But it's, it's very convoluted, John. I've got a lot of stuff floating around in the head. So um, if it seems disjointed, it probably is. I can only imagine. <clears throat> You've been through a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of different things that would add to the spaghetti mess of trails of theology from all the various sources. So I can't even imagine trying to reconcile some of that. <clears throat> and you know, people ask me, you know, what's going to happen? Because after the fall from grace of Mike Bickle, he was an apostle, and all these other apostles have lifted him up for decades now. What? How does all of that work? And I just refer them back, look at the Lateran movement. These guys, same exact thing has happened for century, over decades, you know, going through yeah. this. <clears throat> and what happens is when one falls, they <laughs> they come back later and they lift him up as God's general. So it, Mike Bickle will be God's general for the for our children one day, I'm you certain. You think so? You think that's what will happen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm only speculating, but I can, seriously, I can look back at some re very, very bad people. I mean— Dowie was the con artist that really was the prototype for all of this stuff, and he has been immortalized as God's general, even though you could literally say that more deaths occurred from his quote-unquote faith healing than wow. small wars. I mean, it, it was a wow. frequent occurrence to watch the hearse come in and stake, you know, take a body out of the uh, oh quote-unquote healing homes. So yeah, that's the part that you don't see in God's generals about no. Dowie. No, they they <laughs> leave. <left. laughs> he uh, he started his ministry by stealing a church, and they don't, you know, they leave those kind of things out because if you only tell the good stuff, you can make him look like a saint. Well, that's the case with everybody. That's the case with Mike Bickle. If you take all of yeah. the any of the negative out, he's going to look like a saint. So he will probably be immortalized. And I just I just take a step back from it and. I uh, I did a podcast recently, and we we're talking about the verse in the Bible about the super apostles and how wrong it was to focus on a man. <clears throat> and that's another thing that I have taken. I guess I <laughs> I probably won't go too far with this because it does delve into theology. But 
the way in which we were taught even the figures in the Bible were incorrect because we saw them all as God's generals. We saw them as people who were greater in status than other humans. Right. And that whole framework is incorrect. But I have to be careful who I say that to because there are so many people that were influenced by this that they want to look at all of these humans as though they were generals. And in the end, who's in control, the general or God? And you have to just take a step back and realize that that whole framework is incorrect. Oh, you hit such a, that's such a million dollar point because, you know, in the charismatic, as you know, in the charismatic and probably other movements too, but we have idolized. We And, and I think, so one of the things that I'm realizing, my wife and I have talked about so many times is why did we find ourselves three different times in a cultish or cult-like organization, okay? Yes, there's a common thread of a narcissistic leader with grandiose and pompous visions and, you know, crazy, you know, ideas about what they want to do. But you also have a lot of people who decide to come follow that person who probably had a weakness of some sort. And I, maybe weakness isn't the right word, but a need to be associated with a real influential person, you know, and and so that's been like a reflection point for myself is now knowing what I know, I don't think I would find myself in a cult again because that that thing that I needed to be associated with a um, with a real famous idolized leader that like that I, I feel like that that thing died, you know. Um, but we're so apt and so quick to put a person on a pedestal, whether you call them a general, whether you call them a, uh, you know, a figure in the Bible or whoever they were, a prophet, apostle, fill in the blank. Um, we want somebody like that as humans. We want somebody like that in our life that we can idolize. And so I think that the charismatic movement and some of these splinter movements capitalized on that. And that's probably one of the factors that contributed to their to their growth and influence. So it's like getting back to what you said, um, getting back to the Bible, let's strip away all this stuff that we've been fed. Let's go back to the simplicity, like the guy on the cross, the thief, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, the dude killed somebody or robbed somebody or did something really bad. And there he is in the last second of his life. And he's like, Hey, I think I believe this guy to my left. I think he's the real deal, you know, but he had done anything. He didn't feed the poor. He didn't go pray for healing for anybody. He didn't give all of his money to help people. It was as literally his last minute and he had a change of heart and he was just as eligible as anybody else. Yeah. So that throws a wrench into all of our, um, all the stuff we've been told that like, this is, you know, it's dependent upon what we do to prove that we're, worthy of some kind of blessing so yeah i did a series of podcasts <clears throat> with my cousin who is a um psychotherapist in florida and we were talking about re-victimization and i call it rewiring I'm, I'm sure he has a much more technical term for the psychology but after you leave a cult you have to literally reprogram your brain because they have programmed your brain in a very bad way and it is yeah. traumatic and there are people that like yourself, you leave one cult, you go to the next, you go to the next. And I, I have learned as I re-evaluate my life and I reconstruct, there's some memories that are excessively painful, and there's some that I give undue fondness towards, and especially the people. A lot of my listeners don't get that, but I grew up with some of these cult leaders that I escaped, and they were... You know, I knew them as good people. I realized that there were bad attributes, but I knew them as really genuinely good people. Even William Branham's son, I felt myself to be really close to him. <clears throat> but there was a part of all of this that was evil. And as I rewire my brain, I'll take a painful memory and I'll instead try to find some attribute of that painful memory and think about something that is really enjoyable and rewire it. Take take the bad thought. Now I can replace it with a good thought, and that's how I've yeah. I've coped yeah. with the the leaders that 
I have so many mixed emotions. And when you leave, you want to go find something just like it. I have learned, yeah. I'm a big Bugs Bunny fan, and I've learned to just plug yes. in a face from Looney Tunes to each one of these guys. So I can tell you which leader is Daffy Duck. <laughs> and forever in my mind, this guy is, to me, he is Daffy Duck. And <clears throat> that's. You have one for the, uh, the coyote? <laughs> I do, <laughs> you know, every every single one. Of, and I don't, I don't know if you know, I, I know this in and out. I've watched so many of these, but there was there was the hillbilly Elvis bird and all of okay. these guys. Yeah, <laughs> I, I literally have, you know, all of these guys. If you look at them like Looney Tunes and and in the end, that's really what it is. This is a Looney Tune religion and, or a mm. slot machine religion. Right. So. Yeah, man. I'm I'm definitely going to use that, but thank you so much for for doing this and telling your story. And like I said, yeah. when your wife is ready, I'd like to have her on. And when you okay. start your podcast, I'd like to help you launch it. Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate you having me on, and um, learned a lot. Just continue to appreciate your research and what you're doing in your book. Um, and I know a lot of the other folks that you've had on your on your show. That's been super helpful for a lot of us, um, just to kind of help unpack the IHOP thing. So. Keep up the good work. Appreciate you. Well, if you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the Healing Revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message. Available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. 